State Representative Tacky Chan is joining us once again for one of our weekly Tacky Talks. How are you, Tacky? Doing good, Joe. Happy to uh, be here as we're closing in the end of session on uh, Thursday the 21st and you know, another 90 degree scorcher of extra humidity. Yeah, just to, just to add to the, uh, the the unpleasantness of it all, you know, to add that humidity. But yeah, we're in the middle of a heat wave. So certainly uh, haunt fo- remind folks to take precautions for themselves, their family and their pets, too. Yep. Always a reminder uh, this time of year to uh, not to leave your pets and children or even yourself in a car that doesn't have air conditioning on and uh, or the windows totally open. Uh, but even today, I mean, totally open windows, windows are still going to be very tough. And remember, the UV light is very strong this time of year, despite cloud cover. And, uh, you know, de- definitely the preca- precautions to protect yourself, sunscreen, uh, hats or umbrellas. And, uh, you know, hydrate, you know, always remember to hydrate. Uh, something as simple as that is people... Um, even if you're indoors or air conditioning, definitely still hydrate. Um, you know, it, it doesn't take long for the, uh, the weather to take its toll. And this time of year, it's hard because uh, your electric bill will spike uh, as we have uh, enormous consumption. And, and we're still working hybrid at home. And just like uh, the last uh, couple of years, uh, during the summer times when it was warm, and people saw electrical price increases, your uh, family uh, is home and now it's summertime. So some of your family is probably home, depending on if your kids have run off all day about you. Uh, but, uh, you know, your computers are on, you're, you're plugged in, you know, definitely try to do what I'm doing here right now with, with my laptop. Do not uh, plug it in, use, let the battery drain, plug it in the evening when the uh, uh, power is a little cheaper, you know, off-peak usage. And, um, yeah, try try your best to, you know, not use lights if you have good sunlight and, uh, you know, draw the shades uh, to keep the house cool uh, and try to pick a temperature that's comfortable. But, you know, no reason to have a freezer in the house. And the good news is the latest uh, tests uh, from the beach water uh, look good. So all the beaches are open for swimming. Absolutely. Uh, as you all aware, there was a huge uh, lifeguard shortage, just like all the other workforce shortages. And the DCR have been working hard to uh, create new incentive pay to get people to work at the lifeguard beaches. But if you don't see a lifeguard, you know, obviously take caution. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, a little surprising beach water quality is okay right now, given the fact that we haven't had enough rain to flush to bay out. I mean, we are in a drought condition in many parts of the state and uh, we didn't have a lot of snowfall uh, to pack in the uh, natural aquifers and, and the reservoirs. So, I mean, you know, I, I know people enjoy being outside and whatnot, but I mean, we need rain right now. <laughs> we need rain in a bad way. And uh, unfortunately, when rain uh, in Quincy goes through the storm drain system, it flushes out the storm drains, which actually creates a bit of pollution in our bay. But I mean, also need to water to uh, rise up a bit and uh, you know, let the tides flush the bay out. So, you know, uh, it's kind of a mixed thing. I mean, we want good water quality by reducing pollution in the water, but we need we need the rain right now. Yeah, absolutely. Seeing as we're on the topic of uh, the climate, uh, as you well know, the president was uh, here in Massachusetts just yesterday. And I know you and I had talked uh, previously about uh, the speaker's strong support of renewable energy, specifically wind power. Yeah, this is a twofold issue for the speaker uh, about wind power. Obviously, self-explanatory. You know, we want more renewable uh, energy within our uh, u- utility system that we want to use at home and, and for industry and commercial and so forth. But also, more importantly, as well, is the creation of jobs. So he's tying two things together. It's not just about purchasing a wind power off a of block island in Rhode Island. Uh, you know, as I like to say, you know, you can't see the wind power, you're less likely to be offended by it. Um, but secondly, you know, we need jobs and, uh, you know, that's windmill assembly, part assembly, long-term maintenance and uh, utilizing Brayton Point as one of the transmission node areas because it's an old, uh, dirty power plant or it has a transmission uh, tie-in from there, as well as take advantage of the South Coast's uh, large swaths of industrial water, uh, waterfront property, a mass amount of waterfront industrial property to uh, become the future of windmill assembly and uh, manufacturing of parts and, you know, all the other things that are required uh, to put these things uh, in the water and also the long-term maintenance repairs. And uh, the hope is that if uh, there is a lot of success, you know, in the South Coast, we can replicate this, you know, up and down the coastline of the state regarding, uh, you know, be able to move uh, wind parts onto the water, obviously, and then you can bring it to deep water. I mean, this is, it's offshore windmill, folks. I mean, it ain't hard. You need a coastal based access point to get things into the water so you can go put them you know, permanently uh, as structures. And of course, you know, if you're not on the water, you know, ancillary businesses that support um, these things. Uh, and what, you know, I use the example like the shipyard, right? Those, you know, I'm a little young for the shipyard, but those 
who uh, who remember the shipyard. A lot of the old industrial buildings are now housing actually in the city. You know, we're actually uh, supporting the shipyard needs because not everything was made on the shipyard. So a lot of the uh, parts and uh, manufacturing of small uh, specific items or large specific items, you know, was throughout the city in Quincy, Weymouth, and Braintree and, and delivered in the shipyard. And the vision's actually similar uh, idea when you're trying to put in, you know, 100 foot windmills, 300 plus foot, um, uh, what do you call it, poles or uh, whatever, the structure itself, you know, plus the turbines and the bands and all the plastics and the electronics. And, you know, it's, it's not as simple as, you know, one, ba- you know, a turbine and a uh, one, um, one belt and then you just stick it to a windmill. I mean, it, it's very high tech uh, as well as, you know, general uh, on hands, heavy metal work. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's a very broad range. I think people kind of oversimplify what a windmill is involved. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's kind of long-term vision. We dump uh, quite a bit of money of ARPA money into uh, this, and we're going to put some uh, transportation bond, uh, has also has some money also dedicated towards windmill. And uh, this climate change bill has tax credits uh, of $35 million designed specifically for uh, businesses to support the windmill industry, more specifically the, the manufacturing of, and the support of manufacturing uh, of windmills. So uh, we are going to do everything we can to encourage um, job creation uh, as a result of going renewable. I know that uh, part of it also is uh, uh, restoring or, or maintaining incentives to purchase electric vehicles. Is that still in the works, Jackie? Yeah, it's in there. We create a tiered system based on the price of vehicles. Uh, it is uh, uh, try to incentivize folks to buy, quite frankly, vehicles outside your price range. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I can't afford an electric vehicle. Uh, you know, we're talking about vehicles over $50,000, $55,000. So we established things like $3,500 rebates, and there's like several different rebate tiers, you know, based on the price of the vehicle to try to get people to purchase it. And the idea is that if, you know, there's enough marketplace for uh, electric vehicles and, you know, plug-in vehicles, uh, you know, um, and certain types of hybrids because hybrids can be plug-in. Most people don't realize that. Um, you know, we are able to, you know, get to a market saturation point where uh, the price goes down and, uh, you know, people who are more middle income can afford them, but we got to trigger it right now. Um, and, you know, people are thinking, you know, high gas prices are it's a good time for electric. I do like to remind folks, the electrical uh, price is also very high too. Uh, and this is not a normal world we're living in on energy. This is very abnormal. <laughs> Uh, in a normal world, uh, the uh, cost of energy is sufficiently low enough that the, the cost of gas is, is much, much higher than we're using uh, for a uh, plug-in. But, you know, we're looking at right now, you know, close to $10 um, dollars per kilowatt. Uh, and it's, it's really out of control right now uh, as we're in a summertime peak, plus the impact of Ukraine, plus global market chaos. Um, and uh, supply chain issues regarding demand. Energy is not something you... You kind of like, hey, you know, I can flip switches and, you know, suddenly a whole bunch of renewables or uh, natural gas suddenly becomes readily available. And, and, you know, natural gas particularly, you have to, you know, crank up the refineries, but you max out. Same thing with renewable power. I mean, you still max out at some point. You, your solar panels can't generate anymore and the, the windmills can't, you know, spinning faster doesn't make it from a faster, actually. You, right. All your windmills are tapped out, meaning you've tapped every single one out. And that's why right now we're kind of in a, very unique situation in energy, uh, which I hope to never ever see again in our lifetimes. Uh, once we get, whenever we get past this this situation. So, uh, since last we talked, um, the state now has a new budget. We do have a budget. It's been sent to the governor's desk. We voted on Monday. Uh, that gives us a bit of a buffer uh, for governor's vetoes and amendments. Uh, a go- a gov- the 10 day cl- start clicks on the 10 day veto window actually today, the 21st. We're closing on the 31st. So you know, it's actually a very good budget. And I'm going to tell you, I mean, it's probably going to be the best budget I'm going to ever see in my career. Wow. That includes my time when I staffed. Um, so, you know, we had an amazingly strong uh, prior fiscal year. We're anticipating maybe not equally strong, but, you know, still very robust. Uh, the wages and the uh, cost of um, you know, doing business and everything, obviously driving up everybody's you know, pocketbooks in terms of paying things. But you know, increased wages also means increased income taxes, uh, which also uh, reflects the fact that we actually have to uh, keep up the cost of 
living ourselves, the state doing business just like you at home and business is also going up. But electric bill doesn't like magically stay static. I mean, we have fluctuation as everyone else. So, I mean, that's all accounted for, but we will put record numbers uh, of uh, local aid and um, chapter 70, which is about, I believe in the $50 million zone combined. Plus we have a whole lot of uh, money for local projects, including uh, Queen's Resources, the Germantown Neighborhood Center, um, some money for uh, the historical uh, preservation of the Adams Crips. Um, you know, we put some money in Squatter Point Park uh, regarding the ferry service. Uh, you know, so we scattered a lot of money around uh, different uh, important not-for-profit service agencies and local capital projects and you know, some city projects as well. You know, I, another, I mean, great one is the um, Faxon Field uh, Park, which is one of the few uh, fully accessible uh, playgrounds uh, in the South Shore that has um, uh, people with uh, children who have uh, different types of uh, physical challenges are able to use that uh, playground. Uh, very proud that we have one of those in, in Quincy and you know, full accessibility, you know, equals equality. If we have full accessibility to a place, you know, it's it's not for everyone. It's not equal for everyone. So, you know, that's very important. Um, so we'll see uh, how it continues. Um, we also put a little bit of money in for the MBTA. Actually, it's not a little, it's a lot of <laughs> money for the MBTA uh, regarding the safety standards. You know, as we want to uh, try to get that up to, uh, up to speed as quickly as possible uh, as the, uh, Feds have figured out, uh, you know, understaffing and uh, not fast enough uh, maintenance uh, funding. Uh, even though they spent you know well into two billion dollars on capital projects, you know, we still need to do some more acceleration. And uh, you may have seen the Channel Five story at uh, about on the government center and some of the structural supports at government centers is very very challenged uh, as they take apart that garage, which was I think the site of an unfortunate accident. There was suggested. Um... At, during a hearing on the MBTA, that that agency be eliminated, Techie. What do you think about that? Well, it, it, there is no, uh, I'm not aware of a, a state that has a, um, uh, a transit authority that isn't somewhat quasi independent. And partially it's because of debt service. So, right now, the way the debt service is set up, the MBTA is responsible for its own debt. Your fares and any other external money sources actually pays for the debt service to the T. So it's off the state books. There have been suggestions in the past to help the T by adopting on that debt, but then again, it affects our credit rating mm-hmm. at our level and the taxpayers have to pick up those costs directly as opposed to subsidizing the T using one cent of the sales tax and any federal funds plus fare and advertising and rental money they generate. You know, uh, you know, it would help them immensely in the sense that you know, they'll, they'll take off 30% off their books, 30% of the budget goes to debt. Uh, you know, but it would be shifted to our side of it. And it also won't stop increased debt service anyway, because, you know, it's a hundred, what, 10 year plus system in those capital projects to begin with. So since the state doesn't run the debt service, doesn't run the capital projects, has really no oversight about prioritization. I mean, it's up to the MBT to do so. And this includes expansion. I mean, you know, part of the debt includes, you know, the, the community road service, uh, Old Colony, Greenbush, uh, all the new garages are built on the edges of the green line as part of the big dick mitigation. Um, and, you know, today we have uh, expansion of Green Line into Somerville, uh, but also that's also really federally funded, a lot of fe- waiting for federal funds before you're going to do any kind of expansion projects. And I know for a fact in the books, there's always you know, projects in the Blue Line and others on expansion that it's not going to happen if there isn't assistance from the federal government. So, you know, it's one of those funny things about the MBTA is that the, the debt service is really the most challenging part. And it's an endless, as you all know, you, you know, right at T, it's endless. They're constantly going to have to upgrade escalators. They're constantly going to have to make handicap accessibility even better. They constantly have to do a new Charlie card-ish system, which they're going to definitely need a new system soon. The current system is quite old. Um, you know, and we've all seen what happened to the MBT uh, trains themselves. I mean, it takes uh, years uh, to get uh, bids out, years to construct the parts, years to get them on the rails because it's customized for the MBTH system. Uh, trains are not uh, something by a Walmart big you know, box stores. It's not like, you know, one size fit all. You have to make them to fit our tunnels, you know, a tunnel, you know, hundred year tunnels. You got to make your cars fit there. We obviously want to go to electric slash hybrid and in the future, hundred percent electric buses um, in the long term. There's also meaning we have to build all new MBTA garages, that accommodate the current uh, vehicles, uh, the next stage in transition, and whatever the next stage after that stage is. 
Uh, we don't want garages built for 20 years and have to be torn down because they can't accommodate future clean uh, vehicles. And, uh, you know, we did a little bit of homework. I mean, the uh, purchase of a clean electric bus before you customize it for your uh, customers is about $400,000-ish, give or take. And, uh, you know, obviously the savings is in long term regarding not have to use feet, uh, diesel fuel, but you got that initial upfront cost with diesel buses are closer to two hundred dollars and $250,000. Uh, I know I've been getting a little bit of a uh, flack about the uh, MVTA garage in the old lows, you know, in the four hundred million dollars zone. But I'd like to remind folks that that is not just building a garage just for today's uh, diesel vehicles. If that was the case, I mean, you wouldn't spend four hundred. I mean, you're looking to do four hundred million dollars to future future ready uh, this garage, you know, for the next hundred years, and uh, that's not cheap uh, because you got to be able to transition. They include school buses and mm-hmm. uh, even your own home if you're going to have electric vehicles. I think the future uh, needs to be fast charging. And that means you got to get a higher voltage connections to outside your house. You might have to spend, you know, I think it's like not even 500 bucks for the actual physical devices, but, you know, you have to have installation, you got to have safety, you know, have electrician, you know, local building inspection and all that stuff. So, you know, it can, it can add up quite a bit in the, in the short run and, uh, you know, have an alternative metering system, to, to, uh, which is something that actually this bill is also trying to address and the climate bill about uh, you know, encouraging off-peak charging and, and how do you actually know what you're paying for. And uh, we want to encourage off, off-peak charging, but you don't have a separate meter or separate you know, calculation system. We don't know which um, device in your home is using power to time. So-called smart metering is about whether or not the utility can monitor every plug in your home and know what device is there so it can determine you know, the load power of your home, then you know, determine the load power required in the distribution systems in, in a certain community so have the right amount of power going in. Um, in electric vehicles, you know, we'd like to charge you know, overnight because I said you know, nighttime is cheaper off peak, uh, but you, know, you want to know when that happens for the utility company standpoint so you know how much you know, power to pump into, the, uh, into your part of the grid. Yeah, it's, we really are um, at the dawn of a new energy age, you know, it, 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 it's, 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 it's hard. Change is hard. Well, and there's also a lot of engineering involved. I, 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 people, it's like sausage making, you know, people turn on the lights, no one cares how it got there. If you're turning your water, it's clean and safe. You don't think about too hard about what's going on, right? You know, you flush your toilet, it flushes, it goes away. You don't think about too hard what happens next. Let's be frank about this. Right. right. And same thing on our level. We just talked about the state budget. I mean, you know, we got a lot of chapter 70 money for your schools and every form it's, it's, it's a huge amount of money, but no one really thinks about it. I mean, you're happy, you know, your, your school is, is receiving additional funding uh, from the state, but, you know, we understand this taxpayer impacts and, and, you know, the impact it has on, um, you know, because people's pocketbooks, uh, but, you know, made a conscious effort and long-term investment in our schools. Same thing with school building assistance funding. I mean, that's a very important thing for Quincy. As you all know, there's a whole lot of, school renovation and new schools built in the city. And, you know, the state picks up between 60 and 90% of those costs of the debt. So it takes it off the property tax impact, hopefully, uh, and, but it put it on taxpayer books instead. So, I mean, the entire state is subsidizing Quincy school construction. Does the new budget include legalized gambling, Tacky? Well, you mean more legalized gambling? <laughs> <laughs> Sports betting is still in conference committee. Having yes. Jerry, okay. per- Jerry Paracella, who's the chair of economic development, and emerging technologies, whose office is right next to mine. And, you know, they're working hard and they're talking with the Senate counterparts. And, you know, it's, it's down in the wires, as I pointed out. I mean, today's uh, 10 days before governor's vetoes can be sustained. Uh, we have no intention of being here after July 31st, unless there's a major COVID meltdown of some insanity that, that forces us back into formal sessions. Uh, as a reminder, folks, we never closed session in 2020. We actually maintained formal sessions beyond the uh, rules deadline. We suspended all the rules to get through uh, COVID, where we're still uh, in formal sessions and still doing a whole lot of you know non-session briefings and abnormally high number of briefings during COVID 2020. Um, so, uh, not surprising, a lot of us are somewhat looking forward to actually taking a break after. No, two and a half, uh, actually, let's see, 2019, 20, 20, 21, and now halfway through 22. So the basically three and a half year of nonstop sessions mm-hmm. you know, on TV that we actually have to do uh, before and after sessions run. So you know, we're kind of all looking forward for a little bit of a break here. Uh, but, you know, uh, not to uh, belabor my my desire for a sleep. Um, 
you know, we have sports betting still waiting around. Uh, we did approve internet lottery as part of the economic development bill in the House. Uh, we're not sure what's going to happen to Senate on, on those things. Uh, the Senate hasn't addressed internet lottery since 2016, I believe, was the last time they tried to do something, or maybe 18 was the last time they tried to do something on internet lottery. I know they did like a couple of sessions where they tried to push through the economic development bill. Yeah, and sports betting, I think you guys saw in the news, you know, it was kind of a tough vote in the Senate. I mean, they end up not taking a roll call. Uh, they, they ended up doing by a voice vote, but you need to consent on the final sports betting bill. So there's a lot of bit of a mystery there about where the vote totals are and, uh, you know, whether it can sustain a, a governor's uh, veto or vi- a governor's amendment, um, because I think the governor does want to do this, but, he, you know, maybe what we do is exactly what he wants. He always can amend the bill and send it back, but you still need uh, enough votes to accept or adopt governor's amendments or, or amend the governor's amendment. So I'm not clear what the vote total is over there because, well, there's been informal polling by Stato's news service, you know, until you uh, push the button or you say yay or nay, informal polling to me doesn't matter. <laughs> right, right. It's like exit polling, you know, it's, yeah. You know, I need the roll call. Right. Yeah, you need the actual, you need the actual number before you can uh, put it in, in writing for sure. Yeah, the House uh, has a two-thirds majority on sports betting. So, you know, our, our concerns are not really as much. Right, right. One thing I, I was reading that I, I didn't realize was that there's a, there's a proposal to make the mandatory marriage age 18 years old. I didn't, I didn't realize that it wasn't in Massachusetts. Yeah, I mean, this one surprised me, too, over the last uh, few years of learning about this. You know, Massachusetts uh, does not have a mandatory minimum age for marriage, which means, you know, you can have... Uh, marriages at, you know, age, whatever, uh, you know, 14 year olds getting married. And um, it does happen. I think a couple of thousand marriages a year in Massachusetts are under the age of majority. And uh, we're one of the few states that did not set that um, in the state budget. We finally addressed this issue and it's, it's actually pretty important. I mean, you know, the age of majority uh, is a very, actually fairly modern concept, to be honest with you. It's really about 70 or so years old. I mean, marriage mm-hmm. under the age of 18 was not uncommon in the 1800s, right? Right. Well, people lived a lot less then, too. <laughs> yeah, you're lucky you get to age 40. Exactly, um, yeah. In the 1800s. So not, not surprising, you know, kids were marrying in their uh, mid-teens. But this is the 21st century, and our standards have changed, and our life expectancy has changed. And, you know, ma- family planning uh, has changed. Uh, you know, not planning to have kids at 15 anymore. Uh, you know, people looking to have kids, you know, at, at 30 and older. Um, mm-hmm. So we're living in a very different world. And this is one of those laws that definitely need to be updated uh, to reflect the world we're living in now. And, you know, we're one of the last states remaining, as I said, that, you know, hasn't addressed this issue. So very thankful and happy that we put that in part of the state budget. And uh, we do not expect to have a problem with the governor in this one. Right. Yeah. No, it's it just, it was eye opening, I, I think, for a lot of folks to realize that it didn't, it didn't actually exist until just now. Yeah. One of the things about the legislature is that we get a chance to learn about new stuff that none of us have ever had to experience or encounter ourselves. And that this issue has been kicking around about five or so years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, when the bill first came out, you know, obviously I have no idea, I have to learn about it, listen to you know, the arguments and all that. Uh, and, you know, I was like, this is crazy. <laughs> we should, this is this is the 21st century. We have to, you know, have our laws reflect that. So, you know, hey, I mean, this is a gig where uh, you get to listen to all sides of an issue, and uh, and new issues come up, and you know, you never knew it was an, a problem before until you uh, find out about it. Right. Exactly. Um, are you seeing uh, the state house uh, travelers, uh, vacationers, uh, back to where it might have been a couple of years ago? Yeah, I'm back in the status uh, a bit more often, uh, you know, try to get the former sessions. Obviously, conference committee meetings were in person. So, you know, I definitely uh, made my appearances there. Uh, and, uh, you know, but still, this format is the majority request for meetings. Mm-hmm. I mean, it still remains videos of number one preference for, for most meetings still. Uh, but I've seen some more kids, you know, a few more tour groups, but far, far, far away from 2019 and before where uh, you literally walk through the halls and you just run to children like all over the place uh, as wow. tourists. And even along the Freedom Trail, uh, when you go outside the state house, you know, I saw, you know, mostly full, but not quite full trolleys and, and tour guides. And you have, you know, the people that are wearing um, colonial costumes to uh, colonial outfits to, uh, you know, provide tours and those very heavy, hot outfits in July. Um, but, 
Yeah, I mean, also not hearing as many different languages on the street. You can always, you know, always can hear foreign tourists. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of life, there's life back, but still, still a far cry from, from pre-COVID. Right. And really the future of, of the pandemic is, is really uncertain with all these variants floating around. Well, BA5 is the new one. Uh, uh, the guys who make these decisions and the medical scientific level have decided not to add a new uh, Greek alphabet letter. I mean, we're still at Omicron level, BA now five. I don't know how many variants deep we're in, but BA5 has proven to be more infectious than all other previous variants, which again, it's, it's frightening. And, you know, and also has the um, uh, ability to uh, uh, get past your immune response even faster than previous versions, meaning that you've had COVID before, you're vaccinated, you know, it's a race against time between your body and the, and the virus uh, to, uh, you know, to get to the virus first, right? It's literally like as soon as the virus enters, your body's got to manufacture those antibodies now as quick as it can and get those antibodies to the virus, uh, you know, at lightning speeds. And uh, part of uh, invasion, of course, is, you know, who can get to your, you know, your lung cells first to protect your lungs uh, before they get chewed up by the virus. Um, as the virus wants to make more virus using your lung cells. So, you know, the concern of BA5 is that, you know, they've been talking about um, evasion, so to speak, of your immune system, evasion, your vaccinated, you know, or pre prior infected system where your body you know, knows, hey, it's here, we got to go kill it. You know, it, it moves so fast um, and uh, it takes a little longer for your body to know what's there that your body can't respond fast enough to go kill this virus before it really takes hold. Uh, but again, vaccinations, you know, prior infections, you know, does teach your body how to deal with it. It's a combination of uh, speed. How quickly can, can you respond? Um, the defenses get up fast. And uh, again, you know, we still encourage people to get their boosters and your fourth boosters if you're age eligible uh, to uh, keep your body on alert that should it show up, you know, try to move as quickly as possible to, to, to kill the virus off. But, you know, but very low, low death rate still for those who are vaccinated um, in particular. Uh, and uh, it's only 60%-ish of the population right now is, is BA5, more accurately 6% of infections is BA5. So you still got 40% of, of prior versions that the vaccines you know, still fairly effective against, you know, well over 60% efficacy, you know, for some of the newest ones. And of course, the original or earlier variants, you know, close to the 90% efficacy for the earlier variants. So it, it's not, um, it's not useless, believe me. And as we speak, uh, some breaking news, President Biden uh, tested positive for COVID-19 today and is experiencing mild symptoms, according to a report from Channel 5. <laughs> Well, and sadly, you know, the more you're out there, the odds go up. I, I, it's not complicated. The, the more you're around other people, uh, you don't know where they've been, uh, the odds go up significantly of you potentially catching a virus. I've heard of people getting this thing four times. Yes. And uh, each time they get it, I've been told it's not a positive experience. Uh, and uh, some of these people have long COVID impact and also getting it, which just makes it doubly worse because you have long COVID impact on your respiratory system, longer time to recover and you get infected again when your body's still recovering for the first time just does not make it any better. Mm -hmm. So, uh, no, I'm, I'm not surprised. I'm, I'm sorry to say, I mean, you know, the uh, raw amount of people you're in contact with, um, you know, your odds go up and uh, that's the risk of people taking, uh, whether it be in a, movie theater or a party, or um, in this case, you know, a number of different press conference and gatherings. And you got to admit, it's, it's been pretty good, uh, given the fact that, uh, you know, he's been traveled to Europe, you know, he's traveled to Asia. I know there's a lot of protection around the president. Uh, but I mean, he, he's been meeting a lot of people <laughs> in a lot of travel in the last several years. And, uh, you know, exposure risk was always going to be very high, especially, let's say, BA5 variant, if it is BA5 variant. Uh, you know, given the transmission rate, you know, it, it latches on fast. But he's also boosted four times. Um, obviously, he's the president. He has the best medical care that he could possibly get. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't, if I'm Kamala Harris, I wouldn't get too excited about being president next. <laughs> <laughs> so, and interestingly, too, um, um, you know, the hospitals in our, our area are still pretty full, not necessarily completely because of COVID, but maybe from other procedures and, uh, you know, things that people were putting off over the past couple of years. 
Yeah, I I, uh, I I told you about a website last week, which I shared with you. I'm not how you're going to share that with the public. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, there's a several websites, including the CDC, but there's actually an interesting one, one out of the Mil- Minis- uh, Minneapolis, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of these papers that does the seven day average of the hospitalization rate of ICU as well as hospital beds and seven day average of COVID confirmed patients in hospitals. And it's still floating at 80% capacity for inpatient and right about the same thing for ICU beds. And for example, like Milton Hospital, if I remember correctly, has like six ICU beds maybe and like 30 rooms or something like that. So you, know, you got to put that in perspective, right? I mean, the Suffolk County, greater Boston area, you know, uh, you know, includes like Quincy and Weymouth and others. I mean, has a monstrous number of uh, hospital beds compared to other parts of the country, but still 80% is pretty high. And yeah, not all of it's COVID related, but because of the nature of outpatient services and you know, how we do medicine, I mean, uh, hospital beds generally are not that full to begin with. So you factor in, you know, people would have severe illnesses, you know, Unfortunately, if you have a stroke or cancer or, you know, other life threatening um, happenings that requires you to be in a hospital bed and you got other people COVID, COVID patients, that means they have to keep the bed separated, right? COVID ward uh, takes away beds for everybody else. Um, and, you know, a lot of folks that are uh, COVID positive uh, tend to be unvaccinated. So, you know, again, as I keep repeating all through the last couple of years, you know, you try to do the best to keep yourself safe, particularly if unvaccinated. And, you know, try not to give it to anybody else, you know, even if you are vaccinated because of the asymptomatic component. Uh, but I mean, as Dr. Fauci said, actually quite a few years ago now, it feels like, you know, everybody's going to get it at this rate if the, if the uh, uh, infection and um, the ability to infect faster uh, continues. And it looks like he's right. The faster it's able to infect you, more likely almost everybody's probably going to get it. So, but yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Joe put up that website, you know, please, everyone, you know, take a quick peek. Um, and it gives the idea that uh, hospitals are not going to be able to do as much um, uh, non-COVID, non-emergency you know, life-saving medicines that some of you probably have delayed many uh, medical procedures uh, because of that. And uh, the only ones that can, uh, quite frankly, uh, defeat COVID is ourselves. You know, only we can do it. And uh, I think that messaging is not really well out there. It can't be disease um, being in a hospital. You can only beat the disease by doing the best at home. And I'm in no illusions. I'm, at this stage of the game, you know, I'm still avoiding COVID somehow, but um, I, I'm going to admit that at some point I'll get infected one day too. It's just the question is when. Right. Yeah. And of course it's, it's running into the, the same issue that, uh, you know, a lot of companies are facing is the workforce shortage, even in the healthcare industry uh, between, you know, retirements and attrition and, and, and folks just burned out. Um, so it's a double-edged sword. Yeah. And if you got workforce to become sick, it just doubles up on the workforce shortage problem because you're probably working a uh, shorthand at some stage. One person gets COVID, you know, somebody, you know, hopefully are vaccinated, you know, I've, people get different responses, but I mean, even if you're out like two or three days, like, you know, if you were during flu season, you know, any prior COVID type uh, illnesses, I mean, that, that affects workforce production in general. And uh, if you're uh, at a high volume location and you can infect customers, you know, infect other customers, that means another person's out of the workforce, right? That customer gets infected in your shop. That person has a job somewhere. And now that, per- that other employer is now lost out an employee because, you know, of exposure. Uh, infection. And um, again, you know, vulnerable populations like my mother and, and I'm sure everyone has a loved one or a friend who is a highly vulnerable person, you know, still unrecommended. You should try not to uh, get that person free. Unrecommended, do not give them the disease. Try to do your best to keep them safe. Uh, but I mean, I'll, I'll admit, I mean, I've been out a lot more. People see me a bit more out. Um, obviously, I've been at more outdoor than indoor events, mm-hmm. level risk tolerance. Um, and you know, I wear my mask, I have my wet wipes in my pockets and all that stuff. But the speed of this BA5 infection, you know, can have, you know, it doesn't take long uh, to get it. I mean, it's time duration. The longer you're around someone with the illness, they, they um, talk to you, they breathe on you. I mean, it comes out of the respiratory area. The longer it's, you know, they do that, the odds go up. So, you know, like I said, the only one that can beat the disease is us. You know, it's not anybody else. And, you know, you, everyone has to do their part. But, you know, I am out more. As I've gone to the state house, there are more people around the state house. I have a bit of social distance a bit. 
better in my own office, but you know, I don't have a, a HAV system. I have windows that is now people power washing the retaining wall, so I can't open my windows. Uh, this, this past month, as they're doing a retainer wall repair next to my, literally my window looks at a retaining wall. So, you know, window option isn't available right now. <laughs> open your windows. No, I can't. I got retaining wall splatter all over the place, you know, in front of my window. So, um, so yeah, I mean, but, you know, people should all decide, um, you know, what the risk tolerance is. It's up right. to you all. Yeah, exactly. Um, we haven't talked about world affairs yet today. Um, the latest in Ukraine, Jackie? Well, the, the Russians have uh, keep moving uh, in the Eastern region, uh, kind of taking a little bit of time. And it's definitely looking like tr- tr- uh, trench warfare, mm. uh, where uh, everyone moves a line, uh, tries to hold off, push forward a line, uh, and then stop and, and uh, re- resettle in. And artillery, artillery, artillery. You guys have been hearing about it in the news. I mean, the Russian artillery... It's not exactly precise uh, by any stretch of the imagination. And uh, they don't clearly have things like drone technology that the entire you know, West has given to, to Ukraine, the Europeans, Americans, and many others, where drone technology is a new type of warfare, of, you know, fully you know, battlefield use. Um, and the Ukrainians are still pulling in reserves and foreign, foreign fighters and you know, to get themselves to a million people uh, as a reserve force, which they need to arm and uh, they need bullets. And it's right now, as we talk about supply chain at global level, it is supply chain and moving uh, weapons uh, from uh, European and uh, US and other countries that are trying to support them and get that in. And it's not just guns. I mean, it's also medical supplies, food, blankets, um, keeping that railway, a central area open to get the wounded out. I mean, you've seen the pictures of people just, you know, losing everything in a blink of an eye when a shell hits their home. And you know, and you got to get them out of a war zone. It's it's so sad. And you got like, you know, more than 10% of the population have officially fled the country. And uh, now they're shooting missiles into the, um, the Russians are shooting missiles kind of almost randomly into urban centers uh, on the um, the uh, west side of the country now. Again, fear tactics. But the Ukrainians are really kind of, uh, you know, we're moving to trench warfare. I mean, you'll move, yeah. sit in, move, get, sit in. Uh, and uh, I fully expect more back and forth. And uh, President Zelensky is definitely uh, continuing to be a master at public relations on the global stage. And uh, his wife uh, is actually going to, uh, I think, has she done it yet? She's uh, supposed to speak to the Joint House of Congress in person oh. um, this week. She's been, um, I, I haven't seen it yet either. Um, but, you know, the you know, Russians have now, quote unquote, doing, quote unquote, doing maintenance on the gas system, which is now strangling the Europeans. Thankfully, it's summertime, so you're, you're dealing with summer load and not winter heating. And the EU is, is making the hard push that everyone reduces their natural gas consumption by 15%, which means, sadly, coal is coming back online, which we do not want, but circumstances demand. And, you know, obviously, they're pushing to get more renewables up, but, you know, they can, like I said, there's only so many solar panel windows that, you know, being tapped out now, and you still got to build and add. So coal is coming back online in Europe, which is not good for the environment. Um, and nuclear, uh, which I know is a mixed conversation, politically touching the U.S., but you know, nuclear, you know, is is something that's going to be brought uh, more heavily to the forefront in European countries and even Japan because uh, they have almost no have no fossil fuel capacity in Japan. Nuclear power plants have to come back online because they need to reduce dependence on natural gas, and natural gas is very expensive when you're shipping it by cargo. So. You know, nuclear is coming back online in, in Japan. And I've actually been to Japan's uh, energy supply folks, and they have, don't have a lot of perfect wind. And uh, the geography is not great for sun uh, because they don't have uh, uh, very good locations for, for uh, sunlight. And they also have environmental problems regarding green space and things like solar panels eat green space. Um, mm. So, I mean, nuclear is coming back online in Japan. So, I mean, the Ukraine war, again, so has enormous impact in global supply chain, um, you know, including uh, precious metals, rare metals, which are found in things like your cell phone and electric cars that we talked about. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, obviously continuation of stress of the, um, the, the you know, natural gas supply chain. I'd be curious to see if in the end there ends up being a, an East and a West Ukraine, you know, like Korea and Vietnam. You know, it, it, the, the Russians you know, have demonstrated this before. It's called Chechnya and Georgia, where they claim certain Russian spe- uh, speaking spaces as back in the Russian uh, population. And I think the people, uh, I don't think we would fully realize that in Europe, you know, ethnic 
uh, and uh, linguistic and religious discrimination is how they uh, look at uh, ethnic racial issues. It's not like uh, here where we perceive it as a, a strictly a skin color uh, or appearance. Um, you know, in European countries, they actually more closely look at you know what village you're from, what language mm-hmm. you speak, what religion you practice, what culture you you follow. And, uh, you know, the tendency, not surprising, is people want to be around other people that are like them. I mean, it's a human behavior. Um, So, I mean, the Russian logic is that the Russian speakers are following Russian um, uh, customs and, and, uh, you know, so forth. Uh, You know, the idea is that we want to bring all Russians into the fold, which is one of the reasons why, you know, Putin is looking at Ukraine. Uh, They have a lot of uh, long, long history, good and bad, uh, between that region and the different empires of Russia. But I mean, they're targeting places on purpose to, to invade because they, they're claiming, you know, Russian, you know, oppression and need for independence. I'm not saying they're not oppressed Russians. I'm obviously not saying that, but it's, it's a justification for, for Putin's invasion. Uh, and it won't be the last place he stops. No, will the world and Ukraine accept seceding land to Russia? Uh, including an enormous amount of uh, coastal space to expand their um, influence in the Black Sea. Mm-hmm. Beat them back, uh, trying to take Kiev, and they're able to engage essentially in a you know trench warfare, move, like I said, moving one line at a time, fully backed by more precise U.S. weaponry and European weaponry. Um, you know, winter is coming, and I'm not making just Game of Thrones reference, but uh, those who watched in the spring, as the uh, Russian military heavy equipment was getting bogged down in mud and, and bad weather, uh, it's coming. Um, the, the bog down, uh, and bad weather is going to be hitting Ukraine at some point in the next three or so months, and moving heavy equipment is, is going to be near impossible for, for the Russians to do easily. And the Russians are most likely desperately trying to get their rail system up support. They're very rail dependent. So the uh, Ukrainians will most likely you know, try to target more rail base um, transport. Uh, that way they don't have to rely on trucks and, and getting trapped in the weather. Um, and obviously they're attacking the supply depots of weapons, uh, you, know, you know, definitely targets you got to take out. Um, and uh, the fact they took back Snake Island, I know it's a little island that you all heard about the uh, Ukrainians on there, you know, explicit as they told the Russians and, um, you know, became a, a national stamp of pride for the Ukrainians. It was taken back to Ukrainians and, but that's an important uh, location because it uh, creates a um, defensive position for coastal defenses and shipping lanes in that area. So, you know, it is a kind of a three front ish battle. You got the Donbass mm-hmm. region, you got the uh, region uh, across the Black Sea. And every time uh, the Ukrainians hold out longer, it costs the uh, Russians more money. True. Yes. And, and their economy is feeling the impacts of it as well, I'm sure. Yeah, they were a top. 10, 11, 12, depending what year we're in economy, they're free falling. And uh, they're trying to prop up the stuff like they created their own YouTube channel now to replace YouTube because you can't have YouTube anymore in Russia. You know, they replace McDonald's with its own McDonald's because they bought the McDonald's franchisees out and uh, from McDonald's corporate and uh, trying to like bring back, um, you know, people's uh, at home who enjoy certain type of, of uh, standard living uh, in the long run to give people the same standard living about Western uh, branding. Um, we'll see how that goes. Uh, right. But don't, well, this also in, includes entertainment. I mean, Western, US, European, uh, even Japan, Korea, and other countries, entertainment is global because of streaming. And, you know, people, uh, you know, have gotten used to that quality of life, and they don't have access to that now. So, and interestingly, one of the independent TV stations that shut down uh, in Russia is now rebroadcasting from Latvia, now broadcasting into Russia, uh, independent a non-state owned news uh, and seeing if they can reach people on that. But even they say it's hard to report news when you have a uh, essentially a police state watching everybody about whether or not they're, you know, looking at something they shouldn't look at. And uh, it becomes part of uh, media that's not within Russia. Right. Uh, as we're talking today, Taki, the um, back here at home, the January 6th committee is set to wrap up their uh, hearings this evening, actually. Yeah, I would like to be able to watch that if session doesn't go too late tonight. Um, and uh, I wish I had more time to focus on it. It's been really busy. Dude, I only got to watch the first prime time. They got little bits and pieces during a mid-afternoon when I'm trying to take a bite to eat and before the next meeting begins. Uh, but it's been actually very fascinating. And the Strand Assist Committee uh, 
appears by all means to do an incredibly good job on framing an argument here. This is a public hearing. It's not a trial. Okay, right. folks, you should be aware of that this is not a trial. It's a public hearing, uh, and the public hearing uh, is to uh, present uh, the argument that the committee wants to present, uh, bringing the facts of the case they have done. And this is a police power in the sense that it's subpoena power. So you got to tell the truth. Otherwise, you're going to go to jail. Right. Uh, this is pains and perjury type situation. Yeah, so, as Steve Bannon found out. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and many others, right? Yeah. And uh, whether it be videotape testimony, uh, which is fully transcribed, or in person testimony, uh, you know, it's amazing how um, people in the former president's uh, inner staff, uh, you know, basically saw what was going on in January and said, enough is enough. And the truth is coming out from people that are were physically there or, or people who were with other people that are physically there and between text messages and emails and other things, you know, I, you know, close to eyewitness accounts or people in the room or around the room, you know, we're getting a better picture of what's really going on. And uh, this isn't, you know, coming out of Congress. It wasn't like a Congress person is out there was saying, Hey, this is what happened. I mean, these are people that, you know, the closest, the closest. Um, that are earshot of what's happening. Uh, and, uh, you know, the layers are being peeled back and, you know, it's up to you what you want to believe, but you know, if you can't uh, believe the folks that literally were there themselves, seeing it themselves, I don't know what to tell you. Um, right, yeah, and to be up to the Justice Department ultimately to determine if there's sufficient evidence to warrant further action. Yeah, Janice's committee had its own independent investigators and these weren't like, you know, you or me, I mean, these were like professional investigators, I mean, the law enforcement quality investigators, you know, on top of their committee staffs, you know, to do this kind of work and reviewing, you know, amazing amount of documentation. I, I can't even guess how many pages of documentation the, the staff had to review. Uh, but, uh, you know, if the Janice Committee determines that they have sufficient evidence that uh, they control, um, you know, it's up to them to decide to turn it over to the Justice Department. And uh, I fully expect they probably will. Um, and anybody who was on videotape sworn testimony and uh, in-person sworn testimony, um, you know, that stuff is in public domain now. Uh, as soon as they release it to the, uh, as soon as they saw TV, it becomes public domain. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the Justice Department's already welcome to that material as well as anybody else. And, and also the broad range of people. I mean, you had people who were participant on January 6th, a riot, insurrection, mob, or whatever term you like to use, as well as, you know, people in the inner circle inside the uh, Trump administration. So very broad range of folks. Um, and of course, they had election law experts, as well as uh, lawyers, including uh, the Trump's own election campaign people and his private attorneys. Uh, the two that are uh, having, uh, obviously, difficulties is, you know, Giuliani and, and Bannon and a handful of folks, but also, you know, keep an eye on things happening in Georgia, uh, as well. I mean, you know, they've been issuing subpoenas about um, uh, delegate fraud, uh, electoral delegate fraud, uh, which, you know, has been confirmed in six states involving uh, various Republican uh, officials uh, that are also elected officials, not just any officials, as well as uh, Trump campaign folks, which they have a paper trail that was trying to follow the paper trail to the original perpetrator. And uh, Lindsey Graham and others have been subpoenaed uh, in Georgia about, you know, their participation, because if they don't have a paper trail, you know, in getting subpoenaed to a grand jury, they have no reason to bring a grand jury unless they found something. Yes. Lindsey's, uh, Graham's uh, a, a judge in uh, South Carolina, he's from, you know, said, you got to go. They, they're not going to, the government, you know, it's not going to stop uh, extradition and there's going to be no court order in South Carolina say it's illegal. He's got to go or he's going to face, uh, he's going to face, um, um, what's that called? Um, perjury, no, not perjury, um, whatever, whatever it's called, uh, using mm -hmm. their troopers in cooperation of troopers in neighboring states. So, you know, and you know, it's this, this will continue. And, you know, I think uh, between the January 6th case, January 6th case, the National Department, as well as all these individual states, uh, law enforcement and election officials are going to be um, you know, continue the investigations and, and more information is going to come up. And, uh, you know, there is a paper trail and a smoking gun, whether it be electronic or physical paper, but they're getting their hands on it. Stay tuned, as they say. Yeah. Uh, oh, by the way, is it, there's an election here in Massachusetts this year, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, everyone, please remember to vote on September 6th. 
it's primary day. If you're a Democrat or Republican or unenrolled, all three of you can uh, vote for any uh, any ballot. You only can pick one ballot if you're unenrolled, Democrat, Republican, and you remain unenrolled if you uh, do vote in a primary, if you choose to. Uh, and I'm aware there are the Green Party and um, some other smaller parties out there that do have candidates. Uh, for example, uh, my good friend Smitty Pignatelli out in the Berkshires has a Green uh, Party candidate running against him. Um, but I mean, they have a primary as well. So, you know, and of course, we had a November election, which of course, the date seems like mine right now uh, because of September 6th, but uh, November election on um, November 8th, it's kind of deep. And uh, I know it seems like a quiet ballot, but, you know, again, I encourage people and you all should have gotten uh, in Quincy, your mail-in uh, ballot application. Yes, it's already arrived. Yeah, so if you're uh, not going to be home uh, post uh, Labor Day, or you know maybe you're concerned because uh, Omicron BA five and who knows what other Omicron BAs come up, um, you know has a little hesitant going to the polls, uh, and I do want to see you know a lot of attendance in polls. I do like to encourage people to vote. Um, you know maybe that's a, an option as well as early voting. The city will. Uh, Nikki Crispo and the guys will put together uh, their early voting locations and times so you can go in before uh, if you don't want to use mail-in ballot uh, like you've done for many years now. And of course, you can go election day as well. So I don't know what else we can do. I mean, it's like we made so many ways for you to be a participant and it's up to you to decide to participate. But I am on the ballot, you know, for September and November. So, you know, I do ask that you please uh, check out my box uh, when you... Uh, please, you know, go, go uh, cast your ballot, please. And uh, how do we get a hold of you in the meantime, Jackie? Well, 617 722 2370. 617 2370. It is a new phone number. I'm going to remind people again. Uh, and, uh, you know, I do have the office skeleton staffed. So someone will pick up the phone or you mash a button at this point. I just imagine just mash a button and leave a voicemail. Uh, you can email me at tacky.chan at mahouse.gov, T A C K E Y dot C H N at mahouse.gov. Very happy I'm done with this conference committee because I'm not getting 100 emails a day. So I will be able to find your email this time. <laughs> I think it's more than 100 a day at one point. I think I was looking at like 400 at one point. I'm like, oh my God. Wow. Stay members of Tacky Chan Facebook. I'm sure many of you know, have maybe popped by. Uh, you know, we just put some useful information and some pictures where I've been, different places. And, uh, you know, you know, also some announcements and, um, you know, at tacky chan Twitter, you can see all the people trying to tag me and trying to get my attention to different policy issues. It's almost like I'm not even really using it anymore. It's for everyone else to come at me. Paige, I do know, I am aware we need a website update. It's something we're going to be dealing with in the fall on, on an update. We've been talking about it for a little bit. And of course, you know, QA TV with Joe here and, you know, I'll be back with Mark Crosby at some point in person down the road. And, uh, you know, definitely, you know, follow us at the Quincy Sun and Patriot Ledger, our two local papers as we kind of close of a session we will uh, you know put up more press releases and if you are looking for more of a you know non-tacky talk or you know, written article please go to the house net community council website and sign up for the newsletter uh, i do have a monthly in print newsletter with the house net community council they're very very nice to let me have a, a half a page and i will talk about stuff that you would not read in the boston globe all right stay cool tacky <laughs> No, stay cool, everyone. Please be safe and, uh, you know, definitely be careful. It, it is going to be a brutal uh, few days left in this month or 10 days remaining in this month.